Hello folks, welcome back to English 408, Introduction to Literary Criticism. This will be a video lecture on module eight, race and ethnicity worksheet. Um, and as you can see here, this will be the last worksheet or last theoretical school and approach we will discuss. Uh, the subsequent modules are uh, the theoretical application essay and the final exam. <clears throat> and I will do a separate video lecture for those two. So uh, as I typically do, I will um, take the readings in order here that they appear in the module, module eight. And uh, this is due this coming Monday, April 4th, a week from today. Um, before we dive into, say, Hurston here, the first reading, <clears throat> I just want to kind of clarify these terms here, race and ethnicity, because they are not, in fact, the same and not interchangeable. So you have these images in your Google Drive folder, but uh, um, we as human beings are comprised of another, a number of different categories that produce our individual identities. And <clears throat> these are just some of the more common ones, uh, you know, not included here is, you know, language and, uh, you know, geographical location, because uh, that's not the same as nationality, right? You can be born in say China, but live in the United States. Um, but if you were to put yourself in the center of these kind of Venn diagrams, right? You would be a, uh, a conglomeration, if you will, of all these different categories. And so on the one hand, you have race, which is, really, you know, a kind of genetic proposition or question, right? Like how people appear in terms of their skin color, tone, uh, hair, face, and so on. <clears throat> that is not to say that uh, genetics plays a part in any one of these over here on the right of ethnicity. So for example, one can have, uh, you know, dark skin tone, have a lot of melanin, if you will, in their genetics or DNA, and they may speak, uh, you know, English, or the same kind of person genetically may speak uh, Swahili, may speak uh, Afrikaans in South Africa, may speak uh, Egyptian in Egypt, or uh, you know, any other language, that same person with dark melanin may practice Christianity, or they may practice Islam, or they may practice Buddhism or some other religion, right? So keep in mind that uh, these two terms should not be used interchangeably. Uh, ethnicity and ethnic groups are typically girded around location, a geographical lo location, uh, a shared history, which is where, of course, language and religion comes in, uh, food, because, of course, you know, you're bound, traditionally, historically speaking, by what foods are available near you. Uh, it's not so much the case in our globalized world now, where we ship things all over the place. <clears throat> but uh, I just wanted to sort of parse those out, right, those terms, because, for example, this person here, who we might say is of African descent, uh, could be a person who lives in Africa, could be a person who lives in the United States or Canada, for that matter. Uh, but you can see he's wearing what's called a yarmulke, right? Now, a yarmulke is the traditional headpiece worn by a Jew to go to synagogue or temple. But therefore that means that if you go back to this image here, um, 
this person's religion is Judaism as opposed to the sort of standard Christian or maybe a tribal religion of someone with this perhaps DNA or genetics. Similarly, these women here with um, the hijab, they are practicing Muslims, but you can clearly see that they're Caucasian, right? That we might say, oh, well, someone is, uh, you know, wearing a hijab, they must be Arabic or they must be, uh, you know, from the Middle East or something. Um, that's that notion of essentialism as well as Orientalism we talked about last time in post-colonialism um, that often gets us into trouble, right? That people are much more complex creatures than that. Uh, or here, you can clearly see that these people are, are genetically Asian. I'm not sure if this is in South Korea or in Japan or uh, Vietnam for that matter, but uh, they are practicing the religion of Catholicism, which is a branch of Christianity, right? That we might think that people who are in Asia in general, who are of Asian heritage and genetics might practice something like Taoism or Confucianism or Shintoism or Buddhism, but that's not true. There are in fact, you know, Christian Asians. Um, this old map here of the former Soviet Union gives you an idea of just how varied people are in a nation as large as, you know, what we presently call Russia. Um, you know, it's obviously currently going under contestation with, you know, Ukrainians here who look very much like Eastern Europeans or, or the Georgians and Belarusians. Um, they look, you know, fairly Caucasian. Uh, but as you get further and further to the East, understandably, uh, people become more, uh, for lack of a better term, Asiatic, if you will, in terms of their genetics and facial features. Um, so, you know, you can't really say like, oh, Russians are all looking like Vladimir Putin, because that's clearly not the case. You know, a person in Tajikistan, a Tajik, uh, looks very much like a Middle Eastern person. And a person from, uh, you know, Kyrgyzstan looks maybe like someone from China or Mongolia. So, um, yeah, let's not uh, confuse those terms. And here, I would have used uh, the 2020 uh, 2020 uh, census information. This comes from the census of 2008 to 12, but the current ethnic data uh, from the 2020 census is not yet complete uh, for all kinds of problematic reasons, but you can see here from this legend that uh, it's color coded to show you that, uh, you know, it's the leading or largest ethnic or ancestry group in that county. <clears throat> so if you zoom in on Louisiana and Northern Louisiana, um, the largest ethnic group is black, but that's clearly not to say that, you know, whites and people from India and other, you know, uh, ethnic people don't live in Northern Louisiana. Uh, or the further south in Louisiana you go, the predominant uh, ethnic group is, you know, what we call Cajun, but, you know, it's actually French, you know. So we are, you know, a hodgepodge nation of different ethnic groups as well as racial identities. All right, so got that out of the way. Just wanted to clarify that for you. Um, all right, our first reading here is uh, from Zora Neale Hurston. And I'm taking these two, that is uh, Hurston and Hughes, a little bit of chronological order. So Hurston's piece is 1950 and Hughes's essay is 1926. Um, but they're both, as I mentioned in uh, letter A here, they're both kind of dealing with the same issue of publication and what we call uh, African-American 
literature and authors, which will be a kind of uh, resounding theme in all of these questions, particularly uh, with Kenneth Warren at the end. So the question is, and I, I take both Hughes and Hurston and put them in letter A here. <clears throat> the question, letter A is, Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes both argue for wider and more inclusive representation of African-American authors, though granted their approaches to how that should occur are somewhat divergent. And I'll explain those in a moment. And then I ask, how then realistically do you think that African-American authors can be more widely represented in the literary canon? And I will explain clearly what that means in a moment, if you don't already know. Should there be a separate African-American literary canon? If so, should that literature be taught with regard, or excuse me, without regard to a Western literary tradition and or canon? So, a literary canon, notice this is, you know, one in in the middle, not two, it's two, then it's the weapon. Uh, but a canon is an accepted grouping of typically readings or manuscripts, right? It actually comes from uh, this notion of canon law in uh, study of the Bible, really. Um, <clears throat> And then we have applied it to literature, right? So ecclesiastical meaning biblical rule or law, um, the body of ecclesiastical laws. So what the way we're typically using it here in literature is right here uh, as, a, as a standard that uh, if something is canonical, to use the adjective form, um, it, it therefore becomes a standard. And for the longest time, uh, the Norton Anthology, for decades now, the Norton Anthology of, say, oral literature or American literature or British literature or other kinds of uh, literatures. And in fact, if I just uh, <clears throat> maybe do a search here, show you the different kinds of anthologies that uh, that this company produces. <clears throat> so, Northern Anthology of Western music, not Eastern music, right? Western music. Uh, of poetry, and that would include all kinds of poetry, but be heavy in terms of Western representation of drama, of American literature, as I mentioned, uh, in their different formats, either single volume, multiple volume. Um, of world literature, right? English 200 at Grambling. Um, so, of English literature or otherwise British literature, right? Um, uh, this is where I've been drawing a lot of our texts from this uh, an anthology of theory and criticism, because again, you know, the standard book in the field, uh, world religions, uh, different religions, obviously. Um, of African-American literature, right? Of theology by women, right? Uh, contemporary modern poetry. So often, but not always, often English professors around the globe will choose one or more of these anthologies for whatever type of literature, or excuse me, a course they're teaching, right? Um, you know, if you're teaching, uh, you know, the first part of, say, American literature from the beginnings, you know, late 1600s, early 1700s to Civil War, you might, you know, use the second volume of this American literature uh, anthology, okay, you know, beginnings to 1865, as it's called. <clears throat> 
Um, so the Norton Anthology since 1997 has produced an anthology of African-American literature. And therefore, because Norton is doing it, W.W. W. Norton is the publisher's name. Um, they're based in New York and it's an independent book publisher unlike a lot of textbook publishers. Um, this is now in its third edition. Uh, if I look at the product details here. Um, 2014 uh, was its uh, publication date. Uh, it comes in two volume set of you know roughly 2,800 pages, uh, which is a lot. Um, and this is, as it says, the third edition, but it's gone through obviously, you know, first and second editions. And that means that this 2014 edition has authors in there that were not included in the first and second edition. And typically speaking, all of these you may recognize some of their names. All of these editors for this are African American literature scholars. Um, so, if you look at the contents, and unfortunately, they don't publish this in a PDF file anymore. Um, they it ranges from early, early, you know, vernacular tradition of spirituals and ballads and uh, so on to uh, if we go all the way to the very end, uh, to some authors you may have heard of that are certainly alive today, like uh, Colson Whitehead, right? Uh, or Elizabeth Alexander, or of course, Barack Obama. So these authors have been included in the third edition, whereas they might not have been included in the first and second edition. Um, some more familiar names to you might be, uh, I go back uh, one more even. Uh, sorry, uh, because they include uh, not just uh, fiction and poetry, but they include, as they call it, the vernacular tradition, so gospel. Uh, songs of social change, jazz, rhythm and blues, and hip hop, including Grandmaster Flash, Queen Latifah, Biggie Smalls, Nas, Jay Z, Jean Grey, right? So, uh, what they're trying to show here is that there's a very rich tradition in uh, African American literature, and you can break it down by genre. So, when I talk about the literary canon, or we talk about the literary canon in this question, right? I'm basically referring to a book like this, the Norton Anthology. So with that in mind, um, if you pose the question again, how then realistically do you think that African-American authors can be more widely represented in the literary canon? because she argues you know, in her piece that what white publishers won't print, that they should be, and to a certain degree, so does Hughes. Uh, how can they be more widely represented in the literary canon? Uh, should there be a separate literary canon for African-American literature? You know, the book uh, or textbook here has it as a separate book, but, if you know you go back to those other anthologies I showed you, you know the Norton Anthology of American Literature, for example. Well, do we not include people like Frederick Douglass or Sojourner Truth in you know the nineteenth century of American literature? Do they have to be separated, right? Or you know do we say American literature means only Caucasian people. Um, this is an ongoing and enduring question in literary studies and criticism about how you classify things. Um, and then I say, if so, that is if you 
you know, separate African American literature from other kinds of literature. Uh, if so, should that literature be taught without regard to a Western literary tradition? In other words, should you teach Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, and so on, Phyllis Wheatley, um, without referring to Edgar Allan Poe or Herman Melville or other authors in the canonical Western American literary canon? Um, so you're welcome to take a stab at that. And if you do, you're going to need to uh, look at these two pieces here. Uh, that is the first by Zora Neale Hurston and the second by Langston Hughes. So uh, many of you might know Hurston for her famous novel, Their Eyes Are Watching God, but she also wrote a lot more than that, including essays. Um, and here in uh, the sort of uh, last couple of paragraphs of the uh, Norton anthology editor's introduction, because again, you know, these uh, scanned essays, they come from the Norton anthology of theory and criticism. Um, in these couple of last uh, paragraphs, they say, Though set in a specific political context, when Cold War tensions seem to make imperative, imperative, excuse me, a national unity that appeared to be unattainable, and they're referring here to 1950 when she published this. So, you know, the Cold Wars, everything from roughly, you know, World War II, 1945, the end of World War II, 1945 to say 1990 when the Berlin Wall falls. Uh, though we're kind of back in a Cold War now with Putin. Anyway, um, that in a time when a national unity appeared to be unattainable without better understanding of racial and ethnic minorities, what white publishers won't print is in large part a lively adaptation of an oft-repeated and historically very important argument. Let's pull this up a little bit. In the 19th century, Frederick Douglass and other African-American abolitionists argued that black men and women, slave and free alike, must be portrayed and understood as authentic individuals, right? Not caricatures, not stereotypes. Many 20th century black writers and critics, including Wright, Ellison, Du Bois, Hughes, Baldwin, similarly attacked stereotyping and argued for artistic freedom as certainly Hughes does in his piece. <clears throat> Hurston's call for literary works about average and well-to-do African-Americans is both a plea for realism and a criticism of the typical depiction of Negro characters as quaint and exceptional, right? So that in her essay, she, she wants, you know, a realistic portrayal, not a, again, a centralized, reduced to absurdity, stereotype, caricatured representation. But she also wants, um, you know, a kind of to apply pressure on a criticism of how those characters are portrayed. But Hurston's essay also bears witness to her ongoing literary, critical, and cultural disputes with their peers, like Wright, Ellison, Du Bois, and so on. In her judgment, because of their emphasis on politics, they misleadingly represent Black experience as primarily defined by white racism, from which there is no escape. Hurston stresses that the search for freedom is profoundly personal and cannot be captured by the category of race alone, right? That's a kind of essentialist, you know, think of those Venn diagrams I showed you, you know, gender, sexuality, nationality, race, uh, ethnicity, right? The, to, to say it's, uh, you know, view our African-American because you have been oppressed by, uh, you know, this white supremacist culture, 
Hurston is saying that's too simplified, right? Because the African-American experience uh, is not monolithic. It's very varied. As what white publishers won't print reveals, Hurston insists that the independence to explore the inner lives of her characters, white as well as black, is essential both social politically and artistically. So she wants to, you know, kind of uh, say that we need to, as authors, and as she's trying to do, um, represent characters in fiction, especially, or in drama on stage, um, you know, with a kind of uh, realism, again, for the kind of panoply or spectrum of the African-American author and experience. So uh, I included uh, in here this piece, just so you can have it if you want it, because it's very interesting, but though we're not really discussing it, characteristics of Negro expression that Hurston writes. Uh, very, very uh, informative and interesting, almost like an ethnographic piece. But our piece begins on page uh, 1023. Um, so she begins by saying, I've been amazed by the Anglo-Saxons lack of curiosity about the internal lives and emotions of the Negroes. And for that matter, any non-Anglo-Saxon peoples within our borders above the class of unskilled labor. In other words, she's sort of, you know, uh, pointing out what uh, Barbara Smith and, you know, earlier piece in feminism talked about, you know, the, the lack of, attention to African-American authors and artists um, because they're out there, you know? Um, and it's perhaps not surprising, you know, there is this lack of curiosity, if you will, in 1950 or, you know, post-World War II because of, again, what the publishers won't print. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of, uh, there's a lot of uh, information here that she gives examples of, uh, but I'm gonna kind of jump to the chase here. Publishing houses and theatrical promoters are in business to make money, right? So let's go back to here, Norton, right? Norton is uh, this huge powerhouse publishing, right? Independence since 1923. Um, and they're in the business to make money. You know, it wouldn't be around if they weren't making money. So uh, she goes on to say, they will sponsor anything they believe, publishers will sponsor anything they, that they believe will sell, right? I mean, what publisher is going to invest time and money in an author and project and editing and, and actual physical publication of a work that they think, well, yeah, you know, we're not going to get any profit off of this, right? That that's not a good business model. They shy away from romantic stories about Negroes and Jews because they feel that they know the public indifference to such works, unless the story or play involves racial tension, right? And that's what she had been mentioning earlier, that that's too derivative to sort of one-off, like, you know, the African-American experience is not always uh, about race, though obviously some may argue that. That's often how it's portrayed, though, is what she's saying. The average American just cannot conceive of it, meaning the publication of stories, romantic stories about Negroes or Jews, and would be apt to reject the notion and publishers and producers take the stand that they are not in business to educate, but to make money. Sympathetic as they might be, they can't afford to be crusaders, right? So, you know, it's, think about this. The first, you know, again, this is now in its uh, third edition, but the first edition of the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature did not appear until 1997. That's well after the civil rights movement. And remember this company has been around since 1923, 
why wouldn't there be, you know, uh, Norton anthology of African American literature before 1997? Well, there wasn't enough cultural momentum, shall we say, for people like Norton, publishers like Norton to say, okay, well, uh, we're doing the right thing and we can make money off it, right? Because uh, you have people in the 1980s and 90s start teaching courses solely in African-American literature. And therefore that drives demand for publishers to print textbooks like this. Um, so she goes on to say, um, Let me find it because uh, she has a lot of information. I just want to kind of, I, I skipped over it a second here. Um, <clears throat> she says, uh, after discussing this uh, kind of deeply disturbing, uh, you know, characterization or really caricature of uh, that kind of occurs in the American Museum of Natural History, but she, she calls it above here, the American Museum of Unnatural History. Uh, you know, how you might see, uh, you know, the Negro portrayed in this museum or the Native American for that matter. Um, but she says here, um, the usual phrase is having things in common. Uh, that is to say, what makes African-Americans African-American is they have things in common, okay? Uh, that goes back to the notion of ethnicity as opposed to genetics or race. Until this is thoroughly established in respect to Negroes in America, as well as of other minorities, it will remain impossible for the majority to conceive of a Negro experiencing a deep and abiding love uh, and not just the passion of sex. In other words, if, you know, we're talking here about audiences, right? And what publishers will and will not pu uh, publish. So if they're the audience, perhaps in 1950, mostly Caucasian, uh, believes that it's impossible for African-Americans not to have uh, a deep and abiding love for themselves or other people, unless it involves sex, then the publishers are, aren't going to, you know, do that. In other words, the, the sex quotient is this, you know, unfortunate caricature over determination of African-Americans or people from, you know, I think post-colonialism, people from foreign lands uh, over-sexualized in an unfair prejudicial way. And that, uh, you know, any kind of deep and abiding love, what we might call a platonic love, agape love, to use the Greek, um, is, you know, sort of like beyond uh, the audience's perception. And then she goes on to say, um, is it the same thing? You can translate Virgil and fumble with differential calculus, but can you really comprehend it? Can you cope with our subtleties? And this is uh, referring to a previous uh, anecdote she uses um, about you can teach African-Americans, in this case, you know, differential calculus or how to translate Virgil from the Latin, uh, but are you able to understand our nuanced, you know, the term I think she uses Nordic culture. And she goes on to say that that brings us to the folklore of reversion to type, right? And type being, you know, think of typecast. Uh, or stereotype. This curious doctrine has such wide acceptance that it is tragic. 
one has only to examine the huge literature on it to be convinced. No matter how high we may seem to climb, that is, African Americans may seem to climb, put us under strain and we revert to type, that is, to the bush. Under a superficial layer of Western culture, the jungle drums throb in our veins. And this is an unfortunate caricature that in many ways still exists, especially in tel uh, film and television, right? That um, it's, uh, you know, what people who write screenplays or in production studios in California uh, are feeding the you know, populace, Americans and the world at large, uh, but it's only because they're kind of reinforcing or buying into this, as she puts it, this reversion, reverting to going back to type, right? Uh, to this kind of uh, jungle caricature. So um, she wants to certainly uh, get away from that. Um, and she ends here by saying, it is inevitable that this knowledge will destroy many illusions and romantic traditions, which America probably likes to have around, right? That is her pointing this out, will <laughs> pull the rug from under these reversions to type, she's just pointed out. But then we have no record of anybody sinking into a lingering death on finding out that there was no Santa Claus, right? She's obviously being a little facetious, but it's true, right? That, you know, Santa Claus is not real. And so once you explode the illusion of a Santa Claus, uh, it's really not that big of a deal. People move on with their lives and, you know, like ideology, they realize they've been living in an upside down false consciousness for a while. The old world will take in its stride. The realization that Negroes are no better or no worse, and at times just as boring as everybody else, will hardly kill off the population of the nation, right? In other words, what's wrong with writing, as she already said, uh, a story about, you know, everyday, you know, middle class. African Americans that you know aren't necessarily um, racially driven in its plot, uh, and then she continues. Outside of racial attitudes, so apart from racial attitudes, there is still another reason why this literature should exist. Literature and other arts are supposed to hold up the mirror to nature. This is actually going all the way back to Horace uh, in the you know early early. Uh, Latin writings uh, coming out of Plato. Uh, in other words, that literature is supposed to teach and delight, you know, to, on the one hand, be didactic, to teach us something, to hold a mirror up to nature and say, look, look at ourselves, look how we are as human beings, uh, and maybe at the same time also entertain us. With only the fractional, exceptional, and the quaint portrayed, right? That's what's currently, you know, these types. Uh, think of, you know, Mamie in Gone with the Wind, right? She's a kind of quaint character. Um, with, with that only being the case, a true picture of Negro life cannot be. A great principle of national art has been violated. That is to represent things as they are in realist terms. So if you're thinking about Hurston, when you try to answer this question, right? How should they be widely represented in the canon? Um, for Hurston, it involves a kind of retooling and reimagining of what, you know, should be available to audiences, regardless of what uh, genetic makeup the audience is, right? That, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the compelling features of Aldous Huxley's series or, or work called The Roots, which was made into a series, was that it uh, allowed characters to be fully fleshed out and developed to, uh, as are Toni Morrison's novels. Um, 
and Alice Walkers and others, uh, that they are, you know, not one dimensional, essentialist, stereotypical, you know, exceptional or quaint characters. They're multifaceted, complex. Um, and, you know, she doesn't actually say there should be an, a separate African American literary canon. In fact, she kind of argues that it should be all one hodgepodge. Now, Hughes um, takes a slightly different tact, though, in general, he agrees. And we're going backwards here in time again, you know, to 1926. Um, so here, uh, wait, no, let me. Uh, Yeah. <clears throat> Here in the uh, introductory section to his piece, it says uh, his, meaning Hughes's, his biographer Arnold Rampersad calls our selection The Negro Artist and the Racial Mountain the finest essay of Hughes's life. It was written for the nation as a solicited response to an essay by George Schuler called The Negro Art Hokum, which argued that the idea of a separate black American culture and aesthetic was untenable or undefendable. And again, that's trying to answer this question, right? Uh, should there be a separate African-American literary canon? Here they couch it in the terms of uh, aesthetics, right here, culture and aesthetics because aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that deals with art and what is beautiful. Hughes's reply succinctly captured the varied pressures under which the African-American artist labors. And, you know, smack dab in the Harlem Renaissance in 1926. Uh, first and foremost, perhaps, is the problem of a heterogeneous audience. Heterogeneous meaning, of course, of varied audience is not a single monolithic homogenous audience. The Negro, to use Hughes's term, the Negro poet knows that both black and white people are potential readers of his work. Yet those two audiences have very different expectations and demands. To complicate matters even further, Hughes's ever-present sensitivity to class, that he's always worried about, class issues and economics, understandably, they're saying that deprives him of any simple image of the black audience. High toned blacks, I'm thinking here immediately of Clarence Thomas uh, as his wife, Jenny Thomas is in the news recently, but high toned blacks are most terrified by the artist, afraid that he will endanger their desperate hold on respectability. <clears throat> oh, be respectable, write about nice people, show how good we are, Hughes imagines them saying. Uh, the <clears throat> lowdown folks, on the other hand, are not ashamed of the artist if they know he exists at all. Whereas the better class Negro would tell the artist that uh, what to do, the people at least let him alone. But it's hardly a happy situation for the writer caught between an anxious and an unaware black audience, right? That um, not everyone is aware of what kind of uh, varied, uh, characterizations, portrayals of African-Americans and minorities in general, there are because if you've only been fed one kind of, you know, quaint or exceptionalized, you know, really essentialized representation of a group of people, then, uh, you know, you might be an unaware or anxious audience. Meanwhile, be stereotyped, don't go too far, don't shatter our illusions about you, don't amuse us too seriously, we will pay you, say the whites. That's a quote from his essay, right? These are all things that whites might say uh, to get uh, African-American authors to 
keep those monolithic, universalized, decentralized caricatures in place. This is very much what uh, Franz Fanon argues in his National Consciousness, you know, we talked about last time. The Negro writer can win acclaim and fortune in the white world so long as he does nothing to disturb the white's comfort, their conviction that they are good, enlightened people. The temptations created by these constraints are obvious. Just as the modernist artist often sets out deliberately to shock and outrage the bourgeoisie, so the black artist will be tempted merely to shake the patronizing white audience out of its complacency. Hughes imitates without quite saying it directly that the best work will please neither the black nor the white audience, right? And then he goes on to, or they go on to say that Hughes says, bravely and defiantly Hughes proclaims that it doesn't matter if neither white nor colored audiences are pleased by this work, that is the, you know, Negro poet's work. Free within ourselves and building our temples for tomorrow, the younger artists are already creating an honest American Negro literature. And that, you know, comes to play out, but it's a long time before uh, the wider population becomes aware of it because again, the issue that Hurston points out. So um, again, I'll, I'm kind of going to jump to the chase here. Um, it says here, certainly there is for the African, the American, well, actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I've, apologize. I need to go to the very beginning because he kind of lays the table, sets the table for us in terms of um, perhaps what it's a footnote suggests that this is County Cullen that he's uh, not naming but alluding to very heavily. He says, one of the most promising of the young Negro poets said to me once, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, meaning I believe that Hughes believes, I want to write like a white poet, meaning subconsciously, I would like to be a white poet, meaning behind that, I would like to be white. Um, so he goes on to say, certainly there is for the American Negro artist who can escape the restrictions the more advanced among his own group would put on him, a great field of unused material ready for his art. Without going outside his race and even among the better classes with their white culture and conscious American manners, but still Negro enough to be different, there is sufficient matter to furnish a black artist with a lifetime of creative work. In other words, you know, County Cullen or whatever the poet, whoever the poet was, doesn't have to go very far you know, to look at, again, the panoply or spectrum of why divergent African-American experiences to uh, write about people. To these, the Negro artist can give his racial individuality, his heritage of rhythm and warmth, and his incongruous humor that so often, as in the blues, becomes ironic laughter mixed with tears. But let us look again at the mountain. And this is wall, you know, long before, of course, uh, King's speech, but you know, many of you may know that the mountain as a metaphor is, you know, takes us all the way back to the Bible of you know, Moses going to Mount Sinai to get the law, the Ten Commandments, and so on. Um, in, Hughes goes on to say, and many an upper class Negro church, even now, would not dream of employing a spiritual in its services. So this is 1926, right? Coming after the Civil War, but certainly during Jim Crow, when he's pointing out, uh, having grown up on the East Coast and uh, largely in New York, that African Americans are trying to be quote unquote respectable and therefore would not uh, 
include you know gospel or spiritual in its services the drab melodies in white folks hymn books are much to be preferred we want to worship the lord correctly and quietly we don't believe in shouting let us be dull like the nordics they say in effect the present vogue in things negro and he's talking about the harlem renaissance although it may do as much harm as good for the budding colored artist has at least done this. Here's what it's done. It has brought him forcibly to the attention of his own people, among whom for so long, unless the other race had noticed him beforehand, he was a prophet with little honor. Right? So he was a prophet, but he was a prophet with not much acknowledgement and lauding or uh, acclaim. And so there's that recognition. Um, he's going to end here uh, with uh, an allusion to jazz, because of course jazz, you know, 1920s, it's certainly uh, very pervasive. Most of my own poems are racial in theme and treatment derived from the life I know. And many of them, I try to grasp and hold some of the meanings and rhythms of jazz. I'm sincere as I know how to be in these poems, excuse me, I am sincere as I know how to be in these poems. And yet after every reading, I answer questions like these from my own people, like these questions. Do you think Negroes should always write about Negroes? I wish you wouldn't read some of your poems to whites. How do you find anything interesting in a place like a cabaret? Why do you write about black people? You aren't black. What makes you do so many jazz poems? Um, and the you aren't black is not that he's not, you know, obviously genetically uh, black, because certainly he was. Uh, it's this notion that he's writing poetry that is read by Caucasians and appreciated by Caucasians that makes him not somehow black. Uh, these are very almost uh, caricatured and stereotypical responses to his art as well. Um, right, the, the old subconscious white is best runs through her mind. Uh, he's you know, talking about a particular uh, person there, uh, a, you know, a club woman, but uh, it could have been any one of these people asking the question. And then he ends up by saying, um, but to my mind, the duty, or excuse me, it is the duty of the younger Negro artist, if he accepts any duties at all from outsiders to change through the force of his art, that old whispering, I want to be white, hidden in the aspirations of his people to, so change it from that, I want to be white to, why should I be, want to be white? I'm Negro and beautiful. So I'm not ashamed for the black poet, he says, I want to be a poet, not a Negro poet, as though his own racial world were not as interesting as any other world. Um, I am ashamed too for the colored artist who runs from the painting of Negro faces to the painting of sunsets after the manner of the academicians because he fears the strange unwhiteness of his own features. An artist must be free to choose what he does, certainly, but he must also never be afraid to do what he might choose. We younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark skin selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they're not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. The Tom Tom cries and Tom Tom laughs. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on the top of the mountain, free within ourselves. So when it comes to that question of, you know, should there be, uh, a wider representation in the literary canon of African-American literature, then Hughes was obviously saying yes. 
and here's why. Uh, as far as it should be a separate literary canon, you can see there at the end that he doesn't really care, you know? I mean, he does ultimately, I suppose, right? Um, that if, you know, it were quarantined or shuttered, uh, that would remove an entire, you know, huge portion of the audience. But he's really saying, um, you know, just create your art. Don't have anxieties about uh, which group of people uh, is going to like it. Uh, art is art, you know, it's, uh, it's going to strike some people and it's going to fall flat with other people. Uh, you know, not everyone likes the same song, the same artist, the same painting, the same dance and so on, right? Uh, so let us uh, move on to the next question, which is uh, about uh, Bell Hooks and her take on uh, a cultural reassessment. I want to point out that I am using deliberately the lowercase punctuation of her uh, spelling of her name because she herself uh, has adopted that usage, uh, sort of like uh, the early 20th century poet E.E. E. Cummings. Um, so she was born actually Gloria Jean Watkins, but she's taken on uh, the moniker or uh, sort of professional name of Bell Hooks. And you see here again that even the, the Norton anthology here does the same thing. Um, so when you're, or if, when and if you're writing about Bell Hooks, make sure you lowercase it as she wants. Um, so she, you know, is an academic. She has a PhD from UC Santa Cruz. And she currently, as far as I'm still aware, teaches at Berea College in Kentucky. And um, this piece called Postmodern Blackness uh, gives an entirely different take on African-American literature. So let's look at uh, the question, letter B which says, uh, Bell Hook obs Hooks observes on page uh, 2514, she observes that given the various crises facing African-Americans, economic, spiritual, escalating racial violence, et cetera, we are compelled by circumstance to reassess our relationship to popular culture and resistance struggle, okay? This is the root of the issue. We are compelled to reassess our relationship to popular culture. And she means on the one hand, Americans and Western culture in general, but more specifically African-Americans need to reassess the relationship to popular culture. Many of us, again, meaning African-Americans, many of us are as reluctant to face this task as many non-Black postmodern thinkers who focus theoretically on the issue of difference, think of there the, uh, are to confront the issue of race and racism. So she's saying that there needs to be this reassessment of African-Americans relationship to popular culture and the resistance struggle, but many African-Americans are reluctant to do so. And so I ask, why do you think Hooks believes many African-Americans are, quote, reluctant to face this task of cultural reassessment? What is at stake in such a reassessment to be gained or, and or to be lost? And just how does one go about reassessing African-Americans' relationship to popular culture and resistance? She doesn't mean do away with, uh, popular culture and resistance, but she means to reassess, like how are we as African-Americans looking at our own popular culture? Are we critiquing it honestly and uh, thoroughly? Are we giving it its due, so to speak? Uh, and she has a lot of critical things to say about it. So let's look at her piece. Um, there's a, again, a bunch of uh, 
allusions to deconstructionists we talked about earlier, you know, you know Leotard and Baudrillard and the postmodernist movement, but also Jacques Derrida's uh, deconstruction postmodernist. Um, and she's also going to discuss uh, the truly marginalized black women, right? Um, as Barbara Smith had done earlier. And there, so there are some overlaps between uh, what Barbara Smith was arguing for in terms of, you know, we need a uh, black feminist lesbian idiom to critique uh, those kind of texts. Um, but uh, here she starts with, Postmodernist, and by the way, postmodernism as a movement, shall we say, or cultural aesthetic, um, began around the 1960s, 1960, 1965, so post World War II. Uh, and some may argue that it's still continuing today, right? Um, again, unfortunately, I had to cut an entire week of. Uh, critical theory from this course because we don't have enough time or you know weeks to cover because of both spring break and the Mardi Gras break. Um, but there would have been a whole discussion of postmodernism. So she begins: postmodernist discourses are often exclusionary or elitist, even as they call attention to e appropriate even the experience of difference and otherness to provide oppositional political meaning, legitimacy, and immediately when they are accused of lacking concrete relevance. Very few African-American intellectuals have talked or written about postmodernism, which is kind of true at this point. And this is 1990, she's writing this. Um, she goes on to say, apparently, no one sympathized with my insistence that racism is perpetuated when blackness is associated solely with concrete gut level experience conceived as either opposing or having no connection to abstract thinking in the production of critical theory. The idea that there is no meaningful connection between black experience and critical thinking about aesthetics or culture must be continually interrogated or challenged. So, <laughs> excuse me, she's saying here, uh, similar to what uh, in some ways uh, Hurston, uh, yeah, Hurston said a moment ago, uh, that when you kind of essentialize, you know, reduce African-Americans to a essentialized or reduced stereotypical point of view and say that, oh, you know, blackness over here means that it's you know uh, all about this kind of visceral gut level experience and there's no connection to them the authors to abstract thinking or to philosophy or critical theory she says that that's just basically bs right that it needs to be interrogated or challenged because she's of course one of them you know she's clearly showing that my defense of postmodernism, that is a kind of aesthetic and literary cultural movement, my defense of postmodernism and its relevance to Black folks sounded good, but I worry that it lacked conviction, largely because I approached the subject cautiously and with suspicion. Um, and she's suspicious because of how postmodernism has been written about, but here, right, she's talking about the way in which uh, black women, right, have been kind of written out of postmodernism. Uh, she says, critical of most writing of postmodernism, I perhaps am more conscious of the way in which the focus on otherness and difference, so otherness, think of postmodern, uh, sorry, postcolonialism we talked about last time and difference of deconstruction, uh, that is often alluded to in these works seems to have little concrete impact as an analysis or standpoint that might change the nature and direction of postmodernist theory. Since much of this theory has been constructed in reaction to and against high modernism, which is a literary movement before postmodernism, 
There is seldom any mention of black experience or writings by black people in this work, specifically black women. Though in more recent work, one may see a reference to Cornell West, the male black scholar who has most engaged postmodernist discourse, right? So she likewise is critical of how uh, even African-American authors don't really include black women and black authors, perhaps, you know, save herself in the discussion. Um, so let me get to her kind of uh, real fundamental question that begins here, uh, beginning with uh, rap. So <clears throat> she says, it is no accident that rap, <clears throat> remember this is 1990, so we're just, you know, kind of at that, that point on the cusp of, you know, you know, NWA, uh, you know, uh, public enemy number, number one and so on uh, at the beginning of the, the rap era. It is no accident that rap has usurped the primary position of rhythm and blues among young black folks as the most desired sound or that it began as a form of testimony for the underclass, All right? So she's making these what are called generic or genre connections to rhythm and blues. You know, if you think of testimony and gospel, right? It, meaning rap, it has enabled underclass black youth to develop a critical voice as a group of young black men told me a common literacy. Rap project, or excuse me, rap projects a critical voice, explaining, demanding, urging. Working with this insight in his essay, putting the pop back into postmodernism, Lawrence Grossberg comments, the postmodern sensibility appropriates practices as boasts that announce their own and consequently our own existence, like a rap song boasting of the imaginary or real, it makes no difference, accomplishments of the rapper, right? Like, you know, a rap song or hip hop song for that matter, uh, they can, you know, the lyrics can be of actual factual incidents, you know, say Tupac or other, rappers' lives, or they can be entirely fictional and perhaps, you know, fantastical. They offer forms of empowerment, not only in the face of nihilism, that is where there are no values, but precisely through the forms of nihilism itself, an empowering nihilism, a moment of positivity through the production and structure, structuring of effective relations effective meaning of emotional or moving relations. Uh, and that comes in this uh, essay uh, in 1988. So uh, she's going to want to kind of reject this notion of what, what and how uh, African-American authors in particular have been, and critics have been saying about art by African-Americans, that it's a little too, you know, reductive and essentialist. Postmodern critiques of essentialism, which challenge notions of universality and static overdetermined identity with mass culture and mass consciousness can open up new possibilities for the construction of self and assertion of agency, right? That is critiques, open up new possibilities. That is when you apply pressure on these kind of monolithic stereotypical readings of how we should or shouldn't read the black aesthetic, then it opens up new forms of subjectivities or the self and new sense of agency by artists. When black folks critique essentialism, which is a good thing, she's arguing, we are empowered to recognize multiple experiences of black identity that are the lived conditions which make diverse cultural productions possible, right? When you, when you don't critique or 
you know, apply pressure to essentialism, then, you know, understandably, you don't have uh, real diversity. When this diversity is ignored, it is easy to see Black folks as falling into two categories, nationalist or assimilationist. Black identified or white identified nationalist, meaning that you hold on to that uh, African national heritage um, or assimilationist to you know, obviously uh, adopt the hegemonic, you know, white supremacist kind of ideology and culture. So uh, this is where she, you know, has her quotation and the one that I actually quote right here on page 2514. Uh, she says, given the various crises facing African Americans, economic, spiritual, escalating racial violence, etc. And this is in 1990. So we're still experiencing that. We are compelled by circumstance to reassess our relationship to popular culture and resistance struggle. Right? Those two are different categories. Popular culture is everything from television, film, magazines, music, uh, you know, even, you know, novels for that matter, certain genres of novels, portrayals of African Americans. Uh, social media is now a huge, you know, feature of popular culture. And then resistance struggle. Well, resistance struggle those things can overlap, right? Like on social media, you can see portrayals, videos, pictures of Black Lives Matters protest or uh, you know, Ferguson riots and that kind of thing. That's resistance struggle, but uh, the two aren't automatically connected, right? Um, and then she goes on to say, many of us are as reluctant, many of us as African-Americans are as reluctant to face this task as many non-Black postmodern thinkers, right? So non-Black postmodern thinkers would be like all the ones she listed before, you know, Jacques Derrida, Lyotard, Baudrillard, you know, these kind of French theorists, if you will, um, who focus theoretically on the issues of difference. So we're as reluctant as they are right, to confront the issue of race and racism, because focusing on, you know, issues of difference and talking about it kind of abstractly and philosophically, it doesn't really get at the heart of race and racism in a kind of concrete way, though post-colonialism gets very close to that. Um, so if you were to answer letter B, right, uh, I'm asking like, okay, well, so why do you think she thinks we need this reassessment? Well, it comes down to this notion that uh, it's, you know, well, to put it in her own words, that African-Americans have, on the one hand, been fed an essentialist reductive view of African-Americans, but they've also, in being fed that, have kind of bought into it. And she's saying we need to interrogate it or challenge that essentialist notion. Uh, and then so I ask to further the question, like, so what would be lost or gained if you, you know, kind of shattered this notion of a monolithic universalized notion of the African-American experience to say, you know, Barack Obama's experience versus Clarence Thomas's ex experience or versus, uh, I don't know, Chris Rock's experience or, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, for that matter, like they're all different and yours, right? They're all different experiences and it's too reductive, essentialist and simple uh, to just say, oh, this is what the African-American experience is like in popular culture or uh, in, in resistance movements, right? Um, you know, there are, believe it or not, you know, I mean, you may know, there are African-Americans who don't think that there should be Black Lives Matter protests, right? They may say, well, handle it through the courts or some other way, but don't actually go out and, you know, uh, throw Molotov cocktails and, you know, confront the police. Or to continue, uh, how do you do that? How do you 
take this reassessment of popular culture and resistance struggle and reassess it or change it, right? So that's letter B. And let us move on to the last uh, letter, which is focusing on Kenneth Warren's uh, kind of controversial political view. Uh, oh, wait, you know what? I realized that I skipped over uh, an important text here that doesn't exactly fall into uh, one of the questions, but you certainly can use it as evidence. Uh, and that is this uh, introduction here about what is critical race theory. And I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but because right now um, <clears throat> we are for the past couple of years uh, in this heated, what we call culture war, of the conservative and GOP in this country uh, using critical race theory as uh, an excuse, if you will, to shut down legitimate discussions of history and race in particularly public school settings, high school and uh, even college, um, that I think it's a little important that we at least know what critical race theory really is. So uh, remember that in here, we're talking about in a kind of literary criticism way with Hurston and Hughes and Hooks, um, how do you read texts and culture and literature, right? But what critical race theory really is, is a kind of uh, adjunct or uh, nearby tool or set of tools to help us understand uh, how race has been and continues to be constructed and played out in this country. So, you know, what is critical race theory? Uh, and this is from, uh, as you can see here, the introduction to a 19, or excuse me, a 2006 book from New York University Press called Critical Race Theory and Introduction. Um, so here, in a kind of quick uh, definition, they say CRT or critical race theory movement is a collection of activists and scholars interested in studying and transforming their relationship among race, racism, and power. So that right there, power should remind us certainly of Michel Foucault and others who are interested in institutionalized systemic power. The movement, excuse me, the movement considers many of the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses take up, but places them in a larger perspective that includes economics, history, context, group, and self-interest, and even the feelings of the unconscious of things that have been internalized. Unlike traditional civil rights, which embraces incrementalism, that is, you know, let's go to the courts and slowly get our rights back, uh, and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the very foundation of the liberal order, including equity theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. And these are typically uh, in the realm of the hegemony or you know, the powers that be, these are all principles or categories, tools that uh, the people in power keep in place, right? Uh, that we need to think about this rationally rather than you know, looking at things in a more kind of, uh, we call it uh, urgent sense, right? Um, so continuing in their definition here, uh, there we go. And today, many in the field of education consider themselves critical race theorists who use CRT's ideas to understand issues of school discipline and hierarchy, tracking, as you know, tracking students this way or that way, in terms of high or low education, controversies over curriculum and history, NIQ, and achievement testing. <clears throat> 
Political scientists ponder voting strategies coined by critical race theorists. Ethnic studies courses often include a unit on critical race theory in American studies department, teach materials on critical white studies developed by CRT writers. Unlike some academic disciplines, critical race theory contains an activist dimension. It not only tries to understand our social institutions, but to change it. And this is the kind of uh, anxiety and maybe even fear, you might say, that the current conservative or GOP or Republicans are, are worried about, that you're going to teach all of these, you know, you know, voting strategies and problems in public education in our country to kids who are going to be kind of encouraged to not only become aware of it, right, but to change the situation. So it's out of, I would argue, fear that the hegemony, the, again, you know, largely kind of white privileged uh, conservatives in this uh, anti-critical race theory movement uh, have been promoting uh, that, you know, can't, how dare we teach this in, uh, you know, schools. So uh, there are three tenets that are listed here. Uh, one is racism is not ordinary, uh, that it's basically around and, you know, kind of endemic or, you know, part of social structures. Um, and then the second is that uh, it serves a kind of uh, purpose or justification for ascendancy or one hegemony or one dominant group of the other. And then thirdly, uh, the third theme uh, tenet is that uh, it's race is a social construction, right? Uh, that is to say people with common origins share certain physical traits, of course, but, uh, or such as skin color, physique and hair texture, but these constitute only an extremely small portion of their genetic endowment are dwarfed by that which we have in common and have little or nothing to do with uh, distinctly human higher order traits, such as personality, intelligence, and moral behavior, right? Uh, in other words, they want a more, like uh, Hooks a moment ago, they want a more nuanced view of the experiences of people of color, uh, not just you know, African-Americans. And I'm reminded here, this is a, a digression of this uh, cat I met several years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting backstage for several times. Uh, he's a, a singer, kind of a uh, rock blues singer. And uh, he's, you know, what we might call uh, an African-American albino. Uh, so he's clearly African-American, but he just happens to have, you know, uh, pretty much no uh, melanin or skin pigmentation. And so um, this is precisely what uh, was being said here. Uh, and, and by the way, I, I think you all know that there are many, many, many uh, you know, it's uh, regardless of what continent you're on, you know, it's a genetic characteristic. Um, many, many people who are, you know, uh, genetically, you know, having lack of melanin, depending on, you know, where they're born and who they're born to. So uh, this is right here when they're talking about, um, you know, there's more than just, uh, physical traits of skin color, physique, hair texture, and so on, right? Uh, there's, there's much more to do with uh, higher order traits of, of things that, you know, being able to, you know, sit and listen to a jazz song or blues song or rap song and appreciate it, right? That has nothing to do with your physical characteristics, right? Uh, anyhow, so I just uh, wanted to kind of point that out to you, at least you have an idea of what 
uh, critical race theory is proper and you know what uh, is going on in our culture right now. So this piece by uh, uh, Warren here is, as I said a moment ago, a, a bit of a polemic or controversy. And Kenneth Warren is, as it says down at the very end of this chronicle, hybrid education piece, um, he, he's still there. Uh, he's a professor of English at the University of Chicago, is himself African-American, right? Uh, so I don't want to uh, <coughs> mislead you here. Sorry. Uh, so here is his profile. Okay. He's a distinguished service professor uh, and his PhD at Stanford. Okay. And this is the guy who wrote this piece, right? He focuses on African-American literature and studies, okay? Um, and he says a kind of startling uh, statement here, does African-American literature exist? And he doesn't mean, uh, you know, like physically on the page, manuscript or text form, he's talking about the category of African-American literature. And this takes us all the way back to the first question about the literary canon with Hughes and Hurston. So he's going to say, historically speaking, the collective enterprise we call African-American literature or black literature is of recent vintage. In fact, it's just a little more than a century old. Further, it has already come to an end. And the latter is a fact we should neither regret nor lament. And this again is in uh, 2011, so a decade ago. So he's already saying like, it, you know, the category of African-American or black literature uh, has come and gone. And people say, what? <laughs> I mean, I just showed you the Norton Anthology of African-American literature, all right? He's going to challenge that or is challenging that. African-American literature was the literature of a distinct historical period, namely the era of constitutionality, sanction, segregation known as Jim Crow. And I'll let you digest that for a second. That for Warren here, African-American literature, or what he's defining as African-American literature, goes from roughly after the Civil War, right, 1865, up to, say, the Civil Rights Movement, and just a little bit thereafter, like the, say, 1970s. And he's saying now, what there we're living in now is, he would say is beyond, right, it's no longer can be classified as African-American. He's just going to call it American literature. Um, his, well, let me, I guess, uh, help you parse out this question here. <clears throat> he says, uh, or I say, when Kenneth Worth concludes that authors such as Michael Thomas, Colson Whitehead, Paul Beatty, Andrew Lee, Dancy Senna and Carl Phillips, all of whom he names. He says, they may indeed be African-American, but the works they've written, however, are not. When he says that, okay, because it's a long lead in to the question. When he says this, how is this discernment? Because he's discerning between, you know, they are African-American but the works that they've written are not, he says, African-American. So how is this parsing or discernment between author versus text 
similar to Michel Foucault's concept of author function. Now, he never mentions Foucault in the piece, but what I try to do in the next sentence is remind you of what Foucault had said in his article uh, called, not article, his essay called, uh, What is an Author? Which is a response to Roland Barthes, The Death of an Author. In other words, if these authors are in fact African-American, but their texts are not African-American, does that mean that their texts once published become functions of a social and or ideological product, which is what Foucault says that they do. For example, that is their texts are published by, uh, promoted by publishers and booksellers, right? Which is true that that happens. So let me give you an example. Uh, Colson Whitehead, right? I don't know if you've uh, read any of his works, but uh, he's been on uh, Obama's reading list for a couple of years now. He's won the Pulitzer Prize uh, first for you know the Underground Railroad, which you may have heard of. Uh, not it's not the actual Underground Railroad, right? It's a sort of uh, fantastical vision of it, fictional vision. Uh, he's educated at Harvard. Uh, and his most recent book, The Nickel Boys, uh, has also garnered him a lot of acclaim. So he's won the Pulitzer Prize twice. Uh, so clearly, you know, Warren is saying, yeah, this, this guy is he's obviously African-American, but his work, you know, these, these works, uh, uh, are not, notice the dates here, 1999 to, you know, uh, 2021, that they are not, in Warren's view, African-American literature, okay? And if you go back and look at um, <clears throat> the, what do you call it, uh, Norton Anthology of African-American literature, oh, sorry. Let me just uh, correct my typing here. Computer is only as smarter as its user. <clears throat> so, so this one right here, <clears throat> all right, we talked about this early on. If you look at the table of contents, and go to the, in this case, the very last page, you'll see that, I have to load this up for you. You'll see that in fact, Colson Whitehead, right? Some of his shorter works or chapters on his shorter work, John Henry Days uh, is included. So Colson Whitehead is according to the Norton Anthology of African-American Literature is a canonical or standard author, author in African-American literature and should thus be taught and read by all students who are interested in African-American literature. But Warren is coming along here and saying, no, 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 they're not, right? Um, I'll just, you know, he, he actually closes with that quotation. Uh, he says here, a literature highlighting discrimination is a literature of that class stratum, which is what largely literature of the Jim Crow era was doing. And he talks about you know, in the piece earlier, uh, Frederick Douglass and Du Bois and uh, you know, other authors who point out the ongoing discrimination against African-Americans. And he goes on to say, Warren, and make no mistake, the late 20th century and early 21st centuries, which we live in now, have seen the publication of many very fine novels and poems like Thomas Colson Whitehead, Beattie, Dan Danzi Senna, Andrew Lee, and Carl Phillips, to name a few. By the criteria we use to determine matters of racial identity, 
all of these authors may indeed be African-American. That is, you know, he acknowledges, yes, they're African-American in terms of race, genetics, maybe even ethnicity. However, the works they've written, however, are not. Okay, well, <laughs> how does he get to that uh, argument? Um, he's saying, as I mentioned a moment ago, that earlier works by, whether it's Hughes, you know, think of, uh, you know, A Raisin in the Sun, really called Harlem, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, and, uh, you know, A Dream Deferred, and, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, the, in many ways, not the entire, but a vast swath of 20th century, especially African-American literature, Ralph Ellison, whom he mentions in here, you know, The Invisible Man. In many ways, it's about literature that deals with discrimination of the other, or discrimination of people of color. But he says at present, and again, this is 2011, at present, however, a literature insisting that the problem of the 21st century remains the problem of the color line, that paradoxically obscures the economic and political problems facing many Black Americans, unless those problems can be attributed to racial discrimination. So what he's trying to point out here is in some ways a matter of fact, but in another way, it kind of also obscures some fact. Um, so for example, Here's Warren. He received his PhD from Stanford University, you know, sort of the West Coast equivalent of Harvard. Uh, and he's been teaching pretty much after that at the University of Chicago. These are very elite schools. And therefore he himself is a very accomplished and, um, you know, certainly not uh, the quaint caricature we talked about earlier with, uh, what do you call it, uh, with Hurston. So he or Barack Obama or Clarence Thomas, as I mentioned earlier, or you might even say our own president, uh, Rick Gallo. Uh, these are very high achieving, high functioning, well off, individuals in society. And he's saying that for us to uh, say that any literature written by a black person, either about a black person or not, uh, is not automatically any longer uh, to be considered African-American literature. And again, you know, I said this was, you know, a polemic, right? A polemic is uh, a kind of deliberate uh, controversy. And that's what he's, he's kind of engaging here, right? It's a, a controversial argument. <clears throat> so I would conjecture that my colleagues like uh, Dr. Evelyn Wynn or Catherine Bonner and some others who teach African-American literature, uh, that they would probably have a thing or two to say about Warren here. Uh, that even though he's, you know, African American himself, like he can't, where, where does he get off saying that, you know, uh, Colson Whitehead's piece about, not piece, but novel, uh, the Underground Railroad isn't about race and racial issues, right? Well, I mean, clearly there wouldn't, he wouldn't have this title, first of all. <laughs> if uh, there wasn't an actual Underground Railroad, right? Um, so uh, let me just finish up here. Uh, this is uh, a little bit earlier in the piece. He says, again, in itself, the observation, that observation, nothing new. Langston Hughes in his 1940 autobiography, The Big C, mercilessly panned his Harlem Renaissance contemporary for having believed the race problem had at last been solved through arts plus Gladys Bentley. Uh, 
So a bit of an inside joke there. And that the new Negro would lead a new life from then on in green pastures of tolerance created by County Cullen, Ethel Waters, Claude McKay, Duke Ellington, Bill Jangles, and Alan Locke. Pretty harsh. Hughes then continued acerbically, this somewhat disingenuously. I don't know what made any Negroes think that, except that they were mostly intellectuals doing the thinking. The ordinary Negroes hadn't heard of the heart of the Renaissance. And if they had, it hadn't raised their wages any, which is, you know, kind of true um, that it was the sort of intellectual avant-garde in the Harlem Renaissance that were participating and writing and discussing it. You know, think of Zora Neale Hurston or Langston Hughes himself. Um, and the sort of, you know, outside of Harlem or maybe even in Harlem, the, you know, uh, doorman or the waiter, the kitchen help in Harlem itself, uh, they may have heard of these authors and artists and so on, but it didn't do anything to lift them up economically and socially and so on. Um, so he's saying that uh, here, pointing out that even Hughes going all the way back to the Harlem Renaissance was you know, pulling the veil from this sort of supposed uh, look at this beautiful, you know, moving African American artists. He's saying, like, no, there's a bit of, you know, kind of uh, disingenuous to it. Uh, and just disingenuous Hughes was being because he, of course, profited from and benefited by being part of the Hunter Renaissance, right? I mean, it's what we often associate uh, Hughes with, you know, if you. Look him up, it'll say, you know, he was a major figure in, uh, in the Harlem Renaissance movement, right? Um, so if you wanted to answer that question, um, by all means do so. But um, what I ask is like, so how do you do that? How do you, uh, how do you separate as he wants to do author from text. Okay, yeah, yeah, they're African-American authors, but anything written after the Harlem Renaissance is really, you know, just American literature in general. You know, even if it was a Mexican-American or an Asian-American or whatever, you know, doesn't need to be African-American inflected, he's saying. And then I also ask, or, or is Warren arguing that the very nature of their text uh, does not or cannot fit into a category of what can we call African American, right? He's he's applying pressure on this very term, African American literature. Certainly, it's literature, regardless of what genre. But does it need to be African American, right? And you can argue for or against that. It's up to you to decide. And I think that comes to the end of our. Uh, discussion here for the last worksheet. This is due a week from today, April 4th. And uh, I think that's it, folks. So take care. And again, I will have uh, a separate video uh, briefly discussing the, the requirements for these last two modules, but uh, I will share that privately within Canvas with you, too, with you folks. All right, folks, take care. Be well.